just because this is, of course, part two of the same chapter I preached on last week. This is the chapter about the story of Isaac and Rebecca, of course, in finality, at the end, getting married. In the beginning, the beginning portion is when Abraham brings his servant. He, he causes him to put his hand under his thigh and to swear that he's going to only go unto his kindred. It's, of course, Ur of the Chaldees. He's going to send him there, and he's not going to uh, he's not going to turn to the left hand or the right. He's going in the name of the Lord, and the angel's going to protect him, and he is not going to bring his son there. He promises all of these things he, because that that land is promised unto Isaac. So the, the servant promises, he swears, he's sent forth, and of course we learned a lot of good principles in the first half. Uh, I will relate a couple of things throughout this sermon, but the second half of this sermon is going to be a little bit different. We can of course learn a lot of principles as well from the character. Both layers are there. The Bible is always very deep, and you can learn multiple things. While reading the same story, you can look at it from one angle, and you can learn just lessons and tips about values and Christian character. But then there's also a lot of typology and parallels. And I believe that this last half uh, will be a blessing to you because it's really a treasure trove of just uh, the depthness of the symbolic, sim symbolism of and typology of uh, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ and so forth. So we'll get into that right now. We're going to begin reading here in verse number 29. The Bible says that Rebekah had a brother, and his name was Laban. And Laban ran out unto the man unto the well, and it came to pass when he saw the earring and bracelets upon his sister's hands. And when he heard the words of Rebekah his sister, saying, Thus spake the man unto me, that he came unto the man. So, of course, his, his sister went out first and, and told him these things, and she saw the, the bracelets. He saw the bracelets upon her hand, and then he runs out to meet the man at the well. The man's there at the well, and it says, And behold, he stood by the camels at the well. And he said, Come in, thou blessed of the Lord. Wherefore standest thou without? So you can see that Laban names the name of the Lord, doesn't he? He blesses him in the name of the Lord here. He invites him in. He says, For I have prepared the house and room for the camels. Verse 32. And the man came into the house, and he was un and he ungirded his camels, and gave straw and provender for the camels, and water to wash his feet and the men's feet that were with him. Over and over again, what do we keep seeing? What character of these uh, of, of everyone that's involved? You, know, you have the people that are still there in Ur of the Chaldees area, Nahor area. And what do you see? You see hospitality. What do you see from Abraham over and over again? Hospitality. What do we see from Lot when the angels come in? Hospitality. We see this repeatedly. We see the great hospitality that all these men have. It's, it's a, an important Christian character to have. So we see that here. Look at verse number 33. And there was set meat before him to eat. But he said, I will not eat until I have told my errand. And he said, speak on. So you see this man's priorities. It means business, right? It's, it's uh, you know, you got to work first, and then you party later, right? Or you work first, and then you play later. And that's, that's a good principle. It really is. There's nothing wrong with having fun. Of course, we can have fun at fellowship, but you know what needs to come first? There needs to be some work done. And the guy's like, hey, I appreciate all this food. food. I appreciate everything you've done for me. You know, we'll eat in just a minute. But first, I need to take care of business. First, I'm here for an errand, right? He's a very good ambassador, isn't he? He's a very good servant that's sent forth with a message because he says, hey, I'm here for an important job right now. And that's what needs to take place first, right? Look there at verse number uh, uh, 33 at the end. Of course, it said, and he said, speak on. Verse 30. Four, and he said, I am Abraham's servant, and the Lord hath blessed my master greatly, and he has become great, and he hath given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and men servants and maid servants and camels and asses. So he's talking about all the blessings that have been bestowed upon Abraham because of the Lord, right? One thing I want to point out just to, uh, to preface uh, the points that I'm getting ready to explain, the picture that I'm going to paint for you is, notice what he said he is. He said he's Abraham's servant. And specifically, the word that I used a moment ago was an ambassador. Now, what is an ambassador? It's, it's someone that is a servant, right? But there are variations of servants. You may have different jobs. You can be a steward of a house. You can be a steward of maybe a farm, right? A worker on a farm. What is this man's job right now, specifically? He's an ambassador because he's sent forth with a message. That's the purpose of an ambassador. Someone that's sent forth with a message, and 99% of the time, it's a positive message, isn't it? An ambassador 
is sent forth normally to bring peace between two kingdoms. That's the purpose of an ambassador. It's, hey, you know, we don't want to go to war. Let's settle this through this message. That's the purpose of an ambassador, and that's what he's doing. He's sent forth with a message to uh, Laban here and to Rebekah's household. Look at verse number 36. It says this, And Sarah, my master's wife, bare a son to my master when she was old, and unto him hath he given all that he hath. So we're going to focus on these next couple of verses here. I want to stop here for just a moment. Let me say this first. Who did, who did Abraham picture in Genesis chapter 22? And who did Isaac picture? Who did Abraham picture first? God the Father, right? And who did Isaac picture? He pictured the son, right? Well, well, parallels like that don't just end. They don't just disappear. That relationship continued between the two. And who is the son? He is the seed, isn't he? Isn't Isaac the seed? The direct next descendant of Abraham? Of course, that promise was made uh, to, specifically to Christ. But Isaac is that first step of being the progenitor to Christ coming and symbolizes him in so many great ways, right? This can be demonstrated in so many different uh, stories and chapters in the Bible. So Abraham represents the father, God the father, and Isaac represents the son, right? It would be the son of God who is Christ. Is who that promise was given to was the seed. Now, it was his son, and what does the son receive? What does the seed receive? He receives an inheritance, okay? I want you to notice on the wording at the end of verse number 36 when it says that the seed or that the son is going to be getting. It says, we'll, we'll, we'll read the whole verse one more time. And Sarah, my master's wife, bare a son to my master when she was old, and unto him hath he given all that he hath. I want you to keep that in mind and go to Revelation chapter number 21, verse number 7. I'm going to read you from Galatians chapter number 3. First, verse number 16, a verse I'm sure you're familiar with, it says this. Now Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one. And he says, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So the promise was made to Christ, wasn't it? I mean, that's clear, the, the, the summary of what that verse is teaching, that the promise was actually made to Christ. And it, it, that verse ends and summarizes with, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So who directly was the promise given to? Christ. Right? So the inheritance goes to who? To Christ. The promise that was given to Abraham specifically was a promise of an inheritance. That's what it was. Of his son coming, and I'm going to give this to your son. I'm going to give the land to your son. I'm going to give all these things to your son. Right? It was a promise of inheritance. Tells us the same thing that's in uh, the same chapter of Genesis, uh, I'm sorry, Galatians 3.29. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So it's all us standing in the place of Isaac, right? Because we're standing in the place of Christ. Because Isaac, of course, is not the direct uh, 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 you know, inheritor, but he is the symbol. He is the one that's symbolizing it, isn't he? Because he's the very first seed. That's why he represents that repeatedly. Well, here in Revelation chapter number 21. Once we understand that concept that the promise and the inheritance is actually given to Christ and that we can inherit through Christ by being in Christ. We can be that son and we can receive the inheritance. With that in mind, I want you to look at Revelation chapter number 21, verse number 9. It said, or I'm sorry, verse number 7. It says this, he that overcometh shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he shall be my son. Did you notice what it said? He that overcometh, it says, shall inherit all things. Now go back again with me to Genesis chapter 24. The statement that was made specifically was, and unto him hath he given all that he hath. Now what was he inheriting? He was inheriting all things. He was giving all things. So we see this promise is made to who? Ultimately to Christ. We can see the symbolism here again of Isaac receiving everything. Just like Christ will receive everything, and if we are the Abraham's seed in the place of, right, then what do we get? We receive everything. We receive yeah. all, right? Yeah. Furthermore, I want, I want to read these next couple of verses to build the symbology. It's much deeper than that. Verse 37, it says, And my master made me swear, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife to my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I dwell, but thou shalt go into my father's house to my kindred and take a wife unto my son. Now, I want to explain a couple of things real quick. First, let me have you turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Many people will identify 
uh, mis misidentified the bride in Revelation chapter number 21. And they'll say that you know, the bride is, who do they say it is? What do the majority of people say? The church. the church. That's not what it says in Revelation 21, is it? It defines for you what the bride is or who the bride is. Right. It's as plain as day. It's super clear. I'm going to show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And what does it say? It says it's New Jerusalem, right? He sees New Jerusalem. Amen. Now, we can take this too far to the point of saying, to the, to the point of, of, of writing off other points of symbology, other different uh, layers of symbology that are used in the Bible. Ephesians chapter 5, is that where I told you to go to? Then I have another passage. Ephesians chapter 5 is where I want to look at first. Because the church, and of course we reject the teaching of the universal church. There is the local yeah. church. Right. Yeah, there's churches that are mentioned in the Bible. It's not we're all just a part of one church. And all the churches are all just one church, basically. They're all saved people are a part of one church. That's not a biblical teaching anywhere. That's not found anywhere. Right. There's the local church because the word church means congregation or it means assembly. That defies the very definition of the word church. But some people that may recognize who the bride of Christ is in Revelation chapter number 21 and realize that the bride in that case is New Jerusalem, they may try to take that too far because that's, of course, symbolism. That is, that is still being, it's still some, you know, uh, typology because did, is Jesus literally marrying the, the land in the same way that, that, in the same exact way that you would marry a wife? And is he married to, is it a woman? Is it a female? I mean, of course not. There, of course, and you can definitely, that's what a parallel, uh, you know, that's what you would, uh, symbology is. You can draw parallels, right? Yes, there's an inheritance. Yes, there's a vow. But it's not a literal woman. It's not a female. It's not, you know, she doesn't put on a veil. The, the land doesn't dress up and, and literally marry and say vows like they're getting married, right? It, it, but there, there's parallels, and that's the whole reason why you would use symbology. But you may go too far to say that, that's the, that is the only area where you can apply this typology because the local church is likened unto a bride, is likened unto being specifically the Lamb's wife as well. Now this does not this does not override the teaching in Revelation 21. Both are true. This is where people don't understand the Bible. Both of them are true. Many things can be used as numerous different points of, of typology in the Bible. You can find one thing being used for, like this, here's a perfect example. A lion represents who? Right. Right. And, and right, you see what I'm saying? So you can say that the church is the bride in, in ways, right? The local church I'm speaking of, not the universal church, is the bride. But guess what? The, over in Revelation 21 is the bride. It tells you. So don't let this override that. That's the clear teaching of Revelation 21. But I want, so I want you to look here, as I said, what this uh, is actually teaching here. Of course, it's talking about the local church being the bride, or you could say the land's wife as well. Look in uh, Ephesians 5, and we'll begin in um, verse 22. It says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ... So let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. What parallel did he just draw? Christ, right, being the head of the church. Christ is what? Would be in the position of the man, the husband. The church is in the position of what? The wife, the bride, right? Keep reading. It, 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 it reiterates this. Look at verse 24. Therefore, as the, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. They might sanctify and cleanse it for, with the washing of water by the word. He goes on and on and even explains in verse 32. It says, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So you can see a strong parallel being drawn, right? It's clearly saying in type, the local church is the, the bride or the wife of Christ, isn't it? Go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number uh, 10, I believe. 11. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. We're going to see this again in verse number 1. It says this, Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me 
For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I, might, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. What is it right here symbolizing? What is the church, the local churches who he's writing to, what does it symbolize? The bride of Christ, right? Notice specifically what he called it. He said, a chaste virgin. With that in mind, go back to Genesis chapter number 24. So we have, of course, the father being represented by Abraham. Of course, he's the father of many nations. He's referred to as the father of the nation of Israel repeatedly. We have the son, the seed, of course, is Christ, right? To where is the messenger being sent to? He's being sent to the bride. He's being sent to the virgin. I want you to look here in Genesis chapter 24, where we are here in verse number 16. And the damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin. Neither had any man known her. So we see that we have the father, we have the son, who would represent Jesus. And who is Rebecca? She's the chaste virgin, isn't she? That would be represented as being what? If you like the local church. If you like Christians or people that get saved. Those are the people that are really a part of the local church, right? Would be the people that are added to the church, though such as should be saved, like it says in Acts, right? They're real Christians. They're people that believed in Jesus. Not it has nothing to do with the way you live your life, but whether or not you've trusted in the Lord. You've trusted in Christ. That is what makes you a saved believer. And in this sense, when we look in uh, 2 Corinthians 11... Who was the one espousing them? Who did Paul say it was espousing them? Paul himself. He said, I espoused you unto one. He talks about himself espousing him, right? Well, so we see that Rebecca represents the virgin, representing the church, represents the Christian getting saved. But what else do we have is we have the servant, we have the messenger being sent with what? With a message as the ambassador. What's his job? His job is to go get the virgin, is to go get Rebecca and bring her back to the son. I want you to keep that in your mind. I want you to look down with me at verse number 39. It says, And I said unto my master, Peradventure the woman will not follow me. And he said unto me, The Lord before me, whom I walk, will send his angel with thee and prosper thy way. And thou shalt take a wife for my son, of my kindred, and of my father's house. So we see as the servant being sent forth by the father to bring back those for the son, the servant being the ambassador, he has a message. This is the soul winner, my friend. This is Paul saying, I'm espousing you unto Christ. Rebecca being espoused unto Isaac, unto the son. Being reconciled and brought back. Then notice the protection that's given to the soul winner that it says in verse 40. And he said unto me, The Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with thee and prosper thy way, and thou shalt take a wife for my son of my kindred. Saying that he's going to be protected. He's going to make sure that it's a successful journey. Well, this takes place when Jesus sends forth his apostles, doesn't it? A couple of different things happen. First, I want you to turn to Luke chapter number 10. While you're turning now, I'll explain to you what... The promises that are given in Mark 16, if you're not familiar with them already, they're told at the end that if anything were to bite them, that they'll be, they'll be healed by that, right? That they won't be hurt. They can't do any hurt to them. Not only that, if they were to drink any deadly thing, what would happen? It's not going to hurt them. Why? Because their way was prospered. They were being protected by the Lord while they were sent forth with a message to do what? To bring the virgin to the son. That's the job that they're sent forth with as an ambassador, right? Also here in Luke chapter number 10, notice what it says that is given to the soul winners or to those that are sent forth with that message. Look at verse number 3. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes and salute no man by the way. And if to whatsoever house ye enter, first say, peace be to this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. Notice verse 7. And in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. So they're told that they're going to go, and God's also going to provide for them. One thing that's interesting here is that, is that it tells you that not to carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes. And he says, and salute no man, by the way, saying you mean business. What did the man say when he arrived there? He's like, hey, I'll eat in a minute, but first I have an errand that we need to talk about. 
So he does, that's why he tells them don't salute any man by the way. Not only that, he tells them that he's going to provide them food because the why? The laborer is worthy of his hire. Go back to Genesis chapter number 24. Genesis chapter number 24. And look at what was taking place there, of course, in verse number uh, 33. And there was set meat before him to eat, but he said... I will not eat until I have told my errand. And he said, speak on. So notice there's meat set before him. Why? Because the laborer is worthy of his hire. Representing, of course, the soul winner. Look at verse number 41. Then shalt thou be clear from this my oath. We're continuing here. When thou comest to my kindred, and if they give not thee one, thou shalt be clear from my oath. Verse 42. And I came this day unto the well and said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, if now... Thou do prosper my way, which I go. I don't think it's a coincidence where this man ended up meeting Rebecca. Where was he? It was at a well. The most famous story of any soul wedding is, for sure, John 4, of Jesus preaching the gospel to the Samaritan woman. That is the, fam the most famous story in the entire Bible of someone preaching the gospel is in like a soul winning fashion of going around and preaching the gospel. In the New Testament, there's that, either you can say that, or Nicodemus. But the point is, it's of great significance. And the reason why that's of great significance is so many parallels are drawn with wells and salvation, with water and salvation repeatedly. Like in Isaiah chapter number 12, verse number 3, it talks about, Therefore shall ye draw water out of the... Therefore with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. Over and over again. The, uh, you know, I preached this before. You, you may or may not have heard it. But the Samaritan woman, she goes there to get water. It never records her getting any physical water, but then it tells you specifically that she, uh, the woman left her water pot and went her way into the city, symbolizing that she received spiritual water and she no longer needed that water. Because what did Jesus tell her? He said, I'm going to give you water that's eternal, right? He said that it will, it will be wells of water springing up into everlasting life. That she would never need water again. Why did she do? She just left her water pot behind. Repeatedly, you know, water symbolizes salvation, and there are stories that are gathered around wells where soul winners are going and meeting them there and preaching the gospel or bringing water to someone to get them saved. And where do they meet? They meet at a well where there's water. Look at what it says in verse number 43. Behold, I stand by the well of water, and it shall come to pass that when the virgin cometh forth to draw water. What's that make you think of? Samaritan woman. What is she going there for? Salvation. Look at what it says next. And I say to her, give me, I pray thee, a little water of thy pitcher to drink. What did Jesus say to the Samaritan woman? Woman, give me to drink. Almost the exact same statement. Look at the next verse. And she say to me, both drink thou... And I will also draw for thy camels. Let the same be the woman whom the Lord hath appointed out for my master's son. And before I had done speaking in my heart, behold, Rebekah came forth with her pitcher on her shoulder. And she went down unto the well and drew water. And I said unto her, Let me drink, I pray thee. And she made haste and let down her pitcher from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. So I drank, and she made the camels drink also. And I asked her and said, Whose daughter art thou? And she said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bare unto him. And I put the earring upon her face and the bracelets upon her hands. Over and over again in the Old Testament, of course the Bible talks about the church being in the wilderness. The church existed in the Old Testament as well. Let me say that first. But it will speak of Israel. Just like in the New Testament you have the church who's likened unto a woman. Well, Israel was God's nation at that time, and Israel is likened unto what? A woman. He oftentimes talks about what he decks her with. We see the woman that is in New Jerusalem that is the bride, the lamb, wife. Of course, this is all uh, typology. It's talking about her being decked with gold. It talks about you know the, the city being uh, uh, fashioned and, and all of the great things are in the city. It's supposed to be symbolizing, of course, a woman being decked with gold. That's what we see here. All these things being put upon her, the earring upon her face and the bracelets upon her hands. Now, some people think that that the earring upon her face is like a nose ring. And this is a justification for women to have a nose ring. That's not what this is saying. So it's, it's, it's a difference in language. Notice it says the bracelets upon her hands. Right. Ladies that wear bracelets, do you wear the bracelets in a technical sense upon your hands? No. Nor do you wear earrings upon your face. You wear earrings upon your 
ears. You know what you refer to a ring that's on your nose? A nose ring. If it's an ear ring, it's, on, it's a ring that's on your ear. When it says face, it's referring to all of this as your face. Just like it's referring to all of this as your hand, including your wrist, which you may not think that today, but again, that's the Bible's language. So that's what it's saying. The Bible's language is a little bit different than our language today. You know, in English, as far as the King James Bible being translated, so we need not to uh, you know, interject our own definitions of words today, present day. We need to figure out the Bible's definition, and we could just do that with bracelets upon our hands right there. You understand, well, a bracelet doesn't necessarily go upon my hand. It's an earring in the first place. It's on their ears, and this is all of their face. So that's what that's teaching. It's not allowing you to go get a nose ring. Look there in verse number 48. And I bow down my head and worship the Lord and bless the Lord God of my master Abraham, which had led me in the right way to take my master's brother's daughter unto his son. So you see here is the soul winner rejoicing that he found a soul. And he's happy that the Lord led him in the right way. You know a prayer that I pray every time we're getting ready to go soul winning? People that go with me constantly, like, Brother Russell, I say almost the same thing. Well, I, I, I change up a few things, but there's one thing I say almost every time. I say, Lord, please lead us to someone that might be interested and help us not to waste time with those that are not. Because a, lot of time, a lot of times out there, you'll knock on somebody's door and they just want to talk. You know? And hey, I'm not just being a jerk. I don't want to waste my time with you so that I can find that person that is interested, right? Yeah. That's what's important. We're out there to get people saved, not to have, you know, fellowship with every single door, you know. It's ridiculous, obviously. That's the reason why we go out is to get people saved. And what do we see him here? He's rejoicing that he actually found uh, you know someone in the way. That, that God led him to someone that was in the way. Who is it? The soul, right? The soul to be saved. That's what it represents. Look at what it says there. In verse number 40, and now if you will deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me. And if not, tell me that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. What's he saying? If, if, if this isn't going to work out, if you're not interested, then I'm going to leave and go to someone else. That is, that's this, so we can see this in type as being a true principle of soul winning, isn't it? So in this case, of course, they're looking for the woman that's going to marry the son. You, you, it represents the church, the bride, and the son, the seed, Christ. It's Isaac, right? And he says, hey, if you're not interested, if you don't want to listen, you know, if you just want to pass on this opportunity, then I'm going to go to the right hand or the left. And that's the attitude we should have around soul winning. If you're not interested, you know, you have a great day. God bless you. Go to the next door. You need to go to the, find someone that is interested. Find someone that does want to reconcile with Christ, right. does want to reconcile with the son. Look at verse number 50. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing proceedeth from the Lord. We cannot speak unto thee bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before thee. Take her and go, and let her be thy master's son's wife. Master being the Lord there, of course, God the Father, and the Son being the Lord, of course, being the Son of God. Right. Said, let her be thy master's son's wife, as the Lord has spoken amazing picture. Look at verse 52. And it came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard their words, he worshipped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. Again, we see the rejoicing of the soul winner. Verse 53. And the servant brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment and gave them to Rebekah. He gave also to her brother and to her mother precious things. You know what I think of when I read this verse? That the soul winner isn't just abandoning Rebekah there. He's not just like, hey, here's the directions. Obviously, we can't carry the person there and everything. But you know what he does do before he leaves? You know, uh, the soul winner here in, in type, he, he decks her with all of the, the ointment. He gives her gold. He does all these things for her. A lot of people, they go out soul winning, they give the gospel, and they leave. They're not interested in trying to help that person to grow or to adorn themselves in anything. And maybe even put on the, the, the armor of the Lord. That's what we want them to do, right? You know what they leave? You know what they leave? They do? They just leave. Instead of saying, hey, here's a Bible, or hey, let's do this. And I realize that there are different capabilities, and every single person at the size of our churches right now, every person that we can say, we couldn't afford to get them a Bible. But we can at least start making steps toward that. At least get your mind to the point of doing whatever you can do. That's what you should do. You should right. figure out, what, what can I do for every soul that I get saved? How about, number one, make sure you tell all of them, to come and be baptized. Yeah. Tell them where we're located 
Don't just say, hey, God bless you and have a nice day. You're like, you're like done with the prayer. You're like, in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Did you mean that? Well, praise the Lord, brother. I'll see you in heaven and then walk away. Of course don't do that. You need to get them in something. Right? We want them to come in and we want them to learn the Bible. Amen. We don't want their Christian lives just to end, you know, obviously they're, you know, it's, it's their growth at least. You know, they're going to be saved forever, but we don't want their Christian growth just to end right there. But that's the, the maximum, that's the peak of their spiritual growth in their life. That's not what we want. We want to put gold on them, we want to put silver on them, we want to put the gospel of, of, you know, of peace on their feet. We want their feet to be shod with the gospel of peace. Want them to have on. You want them to have the sword of the spirit, the helmet of salvation. Want them to have all these things. Be girt about with truth. We want them to be girt with all these things. Don't, they? don't just be a soul winner that just you know gets them saved and they're like, God bless you and have a good day. Come on, yeah. that's ridiculous. You know what it is? Lack of compassion is why people don't do that. Right. That's what it is. It's really because they don't care for those people. They're not going soul winning in sincerity and truth. You need to care about the people. That's why he's doing this. You can tell that this servant is sincere. And he cares about the job that he's been given. Even when Abraham's not around, you know what he's doing? He's working hard at what he's doing. Just like when Christ isn't around, you don't see Christ physically, we should still be doing everything. You know, he's not, he hasn't come back yet, right? You should still be working just as hard. Amen. Just as hard. You know, the disciples actually went soul winning in his presence. We don't, right? The servant left, and he was still obedient, and he still did, tried to do his best. He still cares about his job. He's diligent. He's thorough. He's sincere. You should do the same thing when you go soul winning. Amen. You should care about the job of being a soul winner. You don't want to be a lousy soul winner. Right. Who wants to be a lousy? Why even go? You're just not going to, you just don't care. It's like, come on, man. Take your job seriously. Amen. Take the job of being a soul winner seriously. So we see that he cares about the soul. He cares about Rebecca. Look at verse number 54. And they did eat and drink, he and the men that were with him, and tarried all night. And they rose up in the morning, and he said, Send me away unto my master. And her brother and her mother said, Let the damsel abide with us a few days, at the least ten. After that she shall go. And he said unto them, Hinder me not, seeing the Lord hath prospered my way. Send me away that I may go, that I may go to my master. In type, you could say that this represents family that's trying to prevent the person from being saved. Because doesn't it seem like they're like impeding things right now? Let her wait a little while. Or maybe we could do that later. How many doors have you knocked on too when you start trying to get the gospel and people are like, well, you, you guys can just, we'll, we'll have our other opportunities to go to church some other time. Maybe we'll hear about this some other time. And you just try to implore them like, hey, this might be your last time. Right? That's the attitude we should have. Today is the day of salvation. Amen. And that's what he's saying. Hey, i got to go now. You know, you know what has to happen here is she has to make her own decision. Look at verse 57. And they said, we will call the damsel and inquire at her mouth. This is a perfect example of people that their parents may be saved and maybe a child is not. The child has to make their own decision. The child doesn't just get it. What do people say when you knock on their door all the time? Oh, my father's a pastor. Their father may be a pastor and their father may be saved, but that doesn't mean jack for them. Right. That doesn't mean anything for them. That doesn't mean they're saved. They have, you have to, they, you know, they, it needs to be inquired at in her mouth. She has to give her own answer. Right. She has to decide on her own. All the children in here, just because they grow up in a good church, does not mean that they're just automatically going to get saved, which I assume that they would. The parents should be giving the gospel to them as soon as they're right and they're at the age where they understand. Amen. You know, all the, all the nuts and bolts to salvation and the gospel should be giving them the gospel. That's very important. But that does, it doesn't automatically mean that. You know, and, and, of course, the people that their parents aren't giving them the gospel, they're not hearing a clear presentation of the gospel while they're growing up. Maybe they're going to a, a non-nominational church, right? And they don't have this opportunity to someone to just sit down with them. Maybe their parent did get saved and then you come to their door. That doesn't mean anything. They have to accept Christ on their own. They have to put all their faith in Christ on their own. Verse 58, And they called Rebecca and said to her, Wilt thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. That's the moment of salvation. You know how easy it is? I will go. That's how easy it is. Amen. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's interesting how they word it in verse 57. It says, We will call the damsel and, and inquire at her mouth. So what is 
defeated, like I said, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's just that the, 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 the moment of faith, of, of the prayer, of calling upon God and asking him to save you. That's how easy it is. I will go. A person could say those words and be saved. If they understood salvation and that's the way that they worded it and they had all the right concepts in their mind. And they were just like, if they, let's say that they were thinking to themselves, they understood that they're a sinner. They understood that they deserve to go to hell. And they understood that Jesus was God, that he died, that he was buried, that he rose again, that only it was by believing. That's it. It's only by trusting in the Lord. Their works had nothing to do with it. Once they were saved, they were always saved. They could never lose their salvation forever. And they thought about it. Am I going to go to heaven or not? And then they just they, you know what? I'm going to trust Christ right now. I will go. The person truly said that and meant that in their heart right then and there. And that was the moment of decision. The moment of the decision of trusting Christ, they be saved. Amen. That's how simple salvation is. Right. It's why it's like an a very easy task for man to do. Like take a step through a door. Like take a, a bite of bread. Right? Like to drink a water, drink a cup of water. Salvation is it's never likened unto a hard task. Think about that for a minute. That's that's key. That's important to understand. It's never likened unto a hard task. You can pick hard tasks in the Bible, you know, like plowing a field. He's never like, you want to go to heaven, plow a field. Why is that? Right. Because salvation's easy. Right. Every yeah. time salvation is paralleled with just a humanly task to be a figure, it's something very simple. Yeah. And you know also what it is? Something you do one time, right. every time. Take a drink of water. Take, you know, he talks about being the door. Do you know how hard it is to go through a door? He says, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved. How many steps are there to salvation? One step. Amen. Just through the door. Amen. That's right. it. Just trust in Christ. That's it. There's not seven steps of salvation. There's not all this big list of all these different things you have to do. Right. Like the Church of Christ literally teaches seven steps of salvation. Right. Right. Jesus is the door. Amen. All you got to do is take the one step through it. And you know what you're doing? You're choosing that you're going to be in Christ, putting your faith in Christ. And then you're in Christ. That's it. One right. step. You know, it's not like you gotta like walk all the way over to him and then step through the door. It's ridiculous. It's stupid. Salvation is easy. Amen. Salvation is simple. That's why it's always life and very easy things. I will go. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's it. It's very easy. It's simple. She made her own decision. She had to make her own choice. We see Rebecca is going to go with the man. The, the ambassador is bringing back his sheaves with him, isn't he? He came out. Into the field, he was working, and now he's bringing back a sheep. He was victorious. Look at verse uh, 59. And they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said unto her, Thou art our sister. Be thou the mother of thousands of millions, and let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. And Rebekah arose, and her damsels, and they rode upon the camels, and followed the man... <clears throat> And the servant took Rebekah and went his way. And Isaac came from the way of the well of Lehorei, for he dwelt in the south country. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the eventide. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. For she had said unto the servant, <clears throat> What man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant had said, it is my master. Therefore, it says, she took a veil and covered herself. This is the picture of the chaste virgin. She's clean, right? And this is why people today will put on women who wear a veil. You know what else they wear is white. Symbolizing what? Being clean, being pure, being a clean, cleansed virgin. Just like the, the local church uh, is supposed to be. Paul said he espoused us unto Christ as a what? As a chaste virgin. That's what she symbolizes here. Verse 65, for she had said unto the servant, unto the servant, I'm sorry, we, we just read that portion. Go to verse 66. And the servant took, told Isaac all things that he had done. Now, you know what this represents is, who sent him out? The father. You know who he comes back to? Comes back to the son. So when he's done with his task, when the soul winner is all finished, and he's endured, and he's, you know, passed on to the next life, he's fought a good fight, you know, he's going to stand before him. Stand before the sun. 
Amen. That's what he's going to stand before. You know what he's going to do? The Bible says we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. You know, when he's done with his job, when he's done with his task, when he's done with his whole life, and the battle is fought and it's over, he's going to have to stand before that, that son, and the servant is going to have to give an answer for the thing. Right? He's going to have to stand before him, and he's going to have to explain to him. That, and you know, there are a lot of different interpretations of what people think is going to take place. You know, when you stand before him, of course, he's not going to be bringing up, you know, uh, the sins of our past or anything like that. But I definitely believe that there will be things spoken because it talks about we're going to, uh, in our body, we're going to receive that which we did, whether it be good or evil, right? You know, so you're going to be given rewards and things like that, of course. But I don't, I don't take this interpretation that you're going to go before Christ and... Everything that you've done after your salvation is not going to be spoken to you at all. I don't believe that for a moment. I don't, I don't see that in Scripture at all. I have no reason to, no reason to think that at all. It, in, Revela in Romans chapter 15, where I just quoted a moment ago, Romans 14 or 15, where it says, We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. It's speaking unto Christians. And it's talking about the way you treat your brothers and things like that. What's the purpose of that, my friend? Why does it say you're going to stand before Christ that we may receive the things that are done in our body, evil or good? Is he just not going to bring up the evil and only going to bring up all the good things? I don't buy that. That's not the way he operates in this life with us. You know, of course we have our salvation. We're saved. We're not going to go to hell. But when you receive your rewards or maybe rewards are taken from you or, or, or you know, yeah, maybe you lived a lousy Christian life after that, I don't believe for a second that you're going to stand before him and he's just not going to mention, you know, all of the, all of the, 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 the flaws that you had or the, the presumptuous choices that you made after being saved. That's not in Scripture. That makes no sense to be quoted in Romans 15 that we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ when it's speaking in context about doing bad things. Explain that to me. That makes zero sense. That's a foolish teaching. There's a lot of people that teach that. I don't buy that for a second. So he comes back and he stands, the servant, he the, stands before the son. The father sent him out. He goes and he stands before the son. And he's bringing back his sheep. He's bringing back, you know, uh, that which he brought out. He's victorious. And I want you to look at verse 67. It says, And Isaac brought her in to his mother, Sarah's tent, and took Rebecca, and she became his wife. And he loved her, and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Now, there's a couple things I want to hit on. Number one, people will say, this is a teaching, and I touched on this one other time in an earlier chapter. People will say, oh, well, you just become, uh, uh, the, the moment of marriage is, is at the moment of, you know, the sensual relationship. That that's what causes you to be married. Now, number one, that's dumb because that would eliminate fornication. There would be no such thing as fornication because immediately when you have this sensual relationship, we're married. That's ridiculous. That makes no sense. Number two, it says that Mary was Joseph's wife before they had come together. So it makes zero sense. Now that is, in the law, the consummation of marriage. Because prior to that, you could, even after you were married, once you go in under your wife and you discover someone claimed this in her, you can, you can say, hey, she's not a virgin. I thought that I had a clean, chaste virgin, and, and I'm not interested in marrying her, right? So... That is the consummation of marriage where it's all said and done, yes? But that doesn't mean you become husband and wife at that moment. That can be this proof from Scripture of a woman being called a wife before specifically it says they came together. So that's not true. People will look at this also and say, hey, we don't, we don't need our marriages to be officiated by the government. Now, I believe in very, very limited government. But I do believe that this is an area where the government needs to step in and officiate things. And I'll tell you why. Because I believe, I believe in the death penalty for adulterers. Amen. I believe in the law of the Lord and that it's perfect. That's what I believe. And the Bible talks about a bill of divorcement. The Lord talks about a bill of divorcement. Now, if there is a bill that is written for divorce, doesn't it just make perfect sense that there was a bill for marriage? Doesn't that just make perfect sense? How, if, what would be the reason in... in, in um, Let's say, what would be the reason in confirming the divorce in paper if there was no bill of marriage? Because there's a bill of marriage. Okay? But what that tells you in the first place, whether you believe that there's a bill of marriage of, 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 or not, 
What that tells you in the first place is that if the government is the one issuing the bill of marriage, the government's the one that recognized it in the first place. There would be a ridiculous concept that they only step in for the bill of divorce. That makes zero sense, but we still see what the government actually handling marriages, don't you? Now here, I don't believe that the government did anything here. There's obviously a time when people were just dwelling by themselves before God gave the law, right? Before God stepped in and he, you know, uh, issued the law. Who, you know, if you, if you keep going down the line, I'm saying Adam and Eve, you have uh, their children, Cain, Abel, Seth. When they started marrying people, do you, who do you think married them as far as the government? There's a time when that was not feasible or not plausible. But once the government was established, God says there needs to be a bill of divorcement. That is what he says is the proper way to do it. So if you want my opinion on how our government should operate today, if there's going to be a bill of divorcement and the government's going to have to step in, and hey, everything that's done by the government when the law of the Lord is talked about, there's two or three witnesses. So things need to be proven. Now, how stupid can you be to not think that there should be a bill of marriage, but there's a bill of divorcement, and we're going to take somebody and put them to death, we can't even prove that they were married in the first place. That's ridiculous. That is ridiculous. The government's issuing the bill of divorcement. The government is stepping in and stoning a woman if she's committed adultery, uh, adultery or a man if he's committed adultery. Obviously, the government's taking part of these things, and I believe this is an area where the government should be. You know, the, people go too far with liberty into what, what is like an anarchist type mindset, but that's not a biblical mindset. There needs to be some sort of government, and this is an area where I believe that the Bible teaches that the ideal way of marriage would be that the government recognizes the marriages, that the government steps in for the bill of divorcement. It would make sense that they step in for the bill of marriage. It would make perfect sense. You know, that there's a vow, vow, and they acknowledge it. It's printed, it's filed somewhere. These two people are married when they want to get divorced, which is not right unless for the specific reasons, if you want to consider that a divorce. The, the, uh, the bill of divorce would be filed then at that case if he found some uncleanness in her, right? Or if there was adultery, there has to be some sort of record there to track it. It's a ridiculous concept to say otherwise. Now, this is the last point that I want to end on in, this, in the symbology of this chapter. Is uh, something very interesting is uh, Rebecca being being uh, uh, you know the wife representing the local church and Christians and those that are getting saved. We saw the soul winner that brought her back. And reconcile her. It's like Paul espousing the church at Corinth, right? Well, it's very interesting because what happens when a husband and a wife uh, marry? What happens with the inheritance? It basically becomes one, doesn't it? So you see here the picture of those that uh, uh, that would be, uh, you know, the, the that the soul owner brings back. It would be Rebecca. It's pictured by the church, those so that get saved. They would get the inheritance with the son. They get the same inheritance. That's what happens with us. That's what happens here. Brother Russell uh, pointed this out to me just uh, last week. It's really interesting. I never thought of it before. But go to Genesis chapter number 15. You can actually, I feel very confident now that I look this a little bit more. You can identify who this servant is. I feel very confident about this. So we're, ta we're told about this servant a couple of different things in the very beginning. And you don't have to look at this. Stay there in Genesis 15. In Genesis 24, it tells you that uh, and Abraham said in verse 2, 24, 2, and Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had. So we're told, number one, it's his eldest servant. Number two, we're told that he rules over all that he had. It tells you also in verse number 10 that all the goods of his master were in his hands. The man that he greatly trusted because he was there the longest. Well, after uh, Abraham had traveled uh, to the land of Canaan, he was there for a little while and nothing went on. Nothing happened. Well, it tells you in, in uh, Genesis 15, look at verse number 2. It says this, And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. So who was the person working for him at this time? Eliezer. So this was a long time prior to this, wasn't it? And he was the steward of his house. That's interesting. What did it say in Genesis 24? Very interesting. It says that everything was in his hand. It said that he ruled over all of his house. It makes a statement along those lines. What is the steward of your house? Somebody that rules over all that you have. And who, what else did it tell you about that man that ruled over all things in his house? It said that he was his eldest servant. Well, we go way back. And who is the person that's serving him that's devout, that's there for a while? Eliezer. So you, really, really, it eliminates all, all the other options, to be honest. Unless 
I mean, you couldn't even say, well, he laughed. You'd have to say that Eliezer laughed, and somebody replaced him immediately because it's his eldest servant. You understand what I'm saying? It's the man that had been there for the longest. Well, we go way back, long before the promise is fulfilled, long before Isaac is born, long before that. You know what it is? It's Eliezer. Do you know what his job is? He's a steward of the house. Do you know who the eldest servant that's sent forth later is? He rules over everything that he has in his house. So go back to Genesis 24. Keep that in mind. Another type that I believe you could get out of this is, so when when uh, Abram is is um, is talking about uh, you know not receiving the promise yet, he says, "What are you going to give me, seeing that I go childless?" And then he says, "And the steward of my house is this El is this Eliezer of Damascus." What does it seem that he's implying as far as where his inheritance would go at that time? I mean, if you were to have to guess. You would, you would assume that the that the inheritance would be given to Eliezer in that case, wouldn't you? That's what would make the most sense, isn't it? That is his, that would be his, you know, uh, that be that would, I mean that's that, that would be his only option, wouldn't it? Be the person that is most trustworthy. It's the steward of his house. It's the person that obviously here that we see is a, a, a very faithful man that he causes to swear when he has such a very important job. That's his only option. That's who he's gonna go with. Right? So you think of Eliezer, who's the soul winner that goes out. He's a man that, that had the inheritance and then lost it at one point, didn't he? And it, he's, he's not the option in it anymore, is he? But if you think about, about just mankind in general, that's what happened. They were in paradise, and then they lost it. Right? You look at each individual person, that's what that's a picture of. Of Adam and Eve and all of those things. The age of innocence. Uh, that dispensationalists will talk about, it's not just an age. It was the, the, the first stage that Adam and Eve were in, but it's also the stage that every person is in when they're born. They're in an age of innocence or a phase of innocence. And if a child dies, you know where they go? They go to inherit the inheritance. They go to heaven. And they go to paradise where Adam and Eve dwell. So you can see it, uh, a parallel with each person of losing the inheritance, right? And Eleazar... In this case, would have been the one that lost the inheritance. One thing that's very interesting about that, this is actually specifically what Brother Russell pointed out, is his great attitude, even though he lost the inheritance. Think about that. He that would have been given to him, but what you see him doing is rejoicing for Isaac, rejoicing for Abraham, being happy for all of these things. It reminds me of John the Baptist. Right? And people, when you see John the Baptist there, and, and everybody's like, man, you were basically the man, and then Jesus stepped on the scene. Like him, he's like, yeah, he's like no, he must increase, I must decrease, right? So, and you know what that picture is there? Of course, the same thing. But we see him stepping out of the inheritance, but do you know what? In a very literal sense, that promise was not specifically given to Isaac, was it? And we can see, we see uh, Eleazar here, and we see him going and, you know, bringing back Rebecca, and he's praising the Lord the whole time, and he's worshiping God, he's very devout. You know, to Abraham and serving God. We can see that he's a servant of the Lord. There's a very good chance that Eliezer was saved. Eliezer of Damascus. There's a very good chance of that. That Eliezer was trusting the Lord. That he heard of the Lord through Abraham. That he trusted God too. And he was waiting for this promise. Because why is he going out to get this? Uh, uh, to, to help fulfill this promise in the first place. Because he believes in it. That's why. He believes in the promise. He believes in the seed, doesn't he? And in a very, as I said, literal sense, if Eleazar trusted in the seed, do you know what he got when he died? He got the inheritance back. Think about that. Because that inheritance was not a specific real inheritance that was going to Isaac. There were temporary fulfillments that took place immediately, but that's not the real fulfillment. Do you know what it pictures is mankind? Eleazar pictures him losing the inheritance and then getting the inheritance back. When he dies, regaining the inheritance through the true seed by trusting in Christ. So there's a ton of symbology here. It's a very, very interesting, deep chapter. We see Abraham, of course, again represent, representing the Father, the Father of many nations, right? Representing God the Father. We see that on Mount Moriah as well. Of course, the seed is Christ, the Son, which is Isaac in this case, right? We see the servant being sent forth for what reason? To bring to espouse the bride, the church, the Christian. The, the saved, the servant sent forth with a message to bring back 
the bride. What happens is the bride is brought back to the husband, which is Christ. Very deep indeed. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for all the jewels, dear Lord, that are in your word. And how deep that it is, dear God, we thank you uh, for uh, the Bible, that uh, uh, the power that it has in it, the testimony uh, alone, that it is the word of God. There's no book written by man that's even close to this, dear Lord God. Uh, we, we thank you so much, dear God, for everything that you've done for us, and uh, that you would uh, bless our church, we ask, and that you would uh, bless all those that, that have uh, requests and that have need, dear Lord, that are sick, uh, those that are expecting. Uh, we ask a special blessing upon our church that you would help us to, to, to grow this church, dear Lord, help us to have the work, work ethic that is needed and required, uh, light a fire, kindle a fire under everyone here, help us to be great soul winners, and to care for those that we get saved. And uh, not to just cast them away, but to, uh, to strive to adorn them, dear God, uh, in the, uh, the armor of the Lord. Be with us and bless us and keep us safe tonight. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. amen.